Okay, so look, I started giving this talk about a year ago because all of the interest in the, uh, in, the, in the anniversary of Apollo 11, and then since then I've kind of looked back at my life and evolved, how did I get to the situation that you're going to hear about, and uh, there was actually a formula, and that's really the purpose of this talk. The purpose of this talk is not to tell you my, my experiences during Apollo 11, you're going to hear that. But it's, there's a formula that I kind of gleaned how my life went, and I think it's applicable to everybody. And uh, it's kind of obvious when you see it. Maybe a lot of you have already used this formula, but I think it's, it's helpful to put it down and quantify it. It's called the four Ps. So with that, um, let's just go and start off with the, my uh, mentor. Uh, you probably recognize that guy, some of you, Gene Krantz. He's the face of Mission Control. Gene was really like, uh, he was a wordsmith, besides being on console during Apollo 11 and Apollo 13, and you probably know who he is if you've seen the films. He liked to create these, uh, these uh, wonderful sayings. His first one, which m most of us have probably heard, is failure is not an option, and he took that and wrote a book on it. He made a million dollars selling his book, and there you see. Uh, he had another one which is uh, not as well known. Uh, we used it at Mission Control, and uh, in other situations where uh, sort of life and death came upon us. And it's, uh, it, it is luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity, right? And I thought about that, and that's, that's a pretty cool expression, but I have, a, I have a better one. I don't think that luck is a when. I think that luck is a place, and so um, luck is the place you put yourself in when the right time comes along. Think about that. It's a place you put yourself in when the right time comes along. If you put yourself in that place, it's called good luck. And if you don't, for whatever reason, it's called bad luck. And you might go through your whole life saying, I've been unlucky, I've been unfortunate. And I kind of look at it like, you just didn't put yourself in that place when that time came along. So, uh, I've been really lucky. And uh, why do I say that? Well, on, uh, on the night of Apollo 11, there were 400,000 people involved in that mission. Uh, all of NASA, all of its contractors, there were another three billion people watching on television. Three billion. There were less than a hundred at mission control. On any given shift, the number was about 50. I happened to be one of them. Now, I look, I look back and I say, well, how in blazes did that happen? And my initial inclination is that it happened because I went to the right schools. Uh, I had good genetics, I had a good education, but I kept on thinking and thinking and I realized, you know, there was a lot of luck involved in that. And, uh, and that's what you're going to hear about, how you force your own luck to do a situation like this. So what I've learned is it really doesn't matter how unfortunate you think you are, how challenged you are, what your situation is in life. Uh, how the odds seem to be stacked up against you. But if you listen to what's about to happen here, you too could come to the conclusion, uh, like I did, that Werner von Braun was right when he said, impossible is a word I have learned to use with the utmost of caution. And of all the expressions I've heard, that's the one that resonates the most. Impossible is a word I have learned to use with the utmost of caution. Okay, so everything in life starts with dreams. You've got to have a dream, you've got to have a passion. That's what we all begin with. And we have an expression at NASA, let your reach exceed your grasp. That means you think you can go here, go there, go further, always go further. Uh, so in my particular case, I learned 
finding a dream, of course, is easier said than done. We can talk about it. It all sounds great, but it's, uh, it's not as easy as it sounds. But what I was telling you earlier is this roadmap that I've kind of learned, and I've given it a nickname. I call it the four P's. The four P's stand for passion, priority, persistence, and putting yourself out there. Now, we're going to come back to it, but I just want you to put it aside in your side of your head up here. Four P's, all right? So uh, in my case, my dream is to explore. It started really early. It started when I was in my mother's stomach. This is about eight hours before I was born. There I am, my mom sitting on the bed. Get me out of here. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to explore. But I ran into trouble earlier. I wasn't that good a student. I liked screwing around. I bought a little water gun, filled it with ink, and squirted my next door neighbor. And I ended up on the dunce. That's not me, of course, but it's somebody like me who was uh, put up and made to apologize for, for my behavior. And uh, while I was sitting there, this part I do remember, my teacher came up to me, Mrs. Steckler. She pointed a finger and she said to me, the only thing you will ever be good at is taking up space. <laughs> and that's the first time I thought about it. OK, great, take up space. And so I decided I wanted to do that. So I'm a teenager now, right? Teenager now. My father has a business in Manhattan on 39th Street and 8th Avenue. Anybody from New York knows what that is. That's the fashion district. That's where dresses are made. That's where models run runways. That's New York, right? Fashion Avenue. Uh, the thing it was, back in the early 60s when I was a teenager, there was this dress. My father made belts and buttons. There was this dress. It came from Paris. It was called a chemise, but it had a different name for people who worked on Fashion Avenue. They called it the sack dress, obviously. Why did they call it a sack dress? It had no belts. It had no buttons. My father's business went boom like that. And he took me aside one day and he said, whatever you do for the rest of your life, don't have anything to do with the shmata business. <laughs> now, those of you who don't know what shmata is, shmata is Yiddish for rag or for, business or for clothing. And in New York, the shmata business is the fashion business. Everybody knows that. He said, don't touch it with a 10-foot pole. So now what happens? I graduate high school. I apply to Columbia. And I started to have my first little rush of luck. The year that I applied, they had lower admission standards. <laughs> and I got in. And then I graduated. And I took the first job that came along. Now, I applied to NASA thinking, no way in heck I'm getting this job. But I'm going to apply anyway. So I then took the first job that did come along with a company called Beckton Dickinson in Rutherford, New Jersey, making needles. So here I am making needles. Needles for blood taking devices, stuff like that. And then NASA starts hiring like crazy for Project Apollo. And about 10 or 11 months after I start this job, I get a letter, report to Houston, right? I'm through the moon, no pun intended. This is really exciting. So I get on a plane, I go to Houston, I talk to people, I find out, what am I going to do? I don't know anything about this. What are you going to do? And they say, you're going to help us build a schmata. <laughs> the most complex schmata ever built. And, and second thought, oh my god, what my father's going to think about this. And then I think, I know nothing about spacesuits, and they're complicated. And I've got to learn fast. So I start boning up, boning up really hard. I never learned any of this at Columbia, none of it. This is all new stuff. They didn't care at the time. They're hiring people like mad. And uh, if you had a bachelor's degree, it didn't matter what it was in, they were hiring. It was a miraculous time. So first thing I learned is without a spacesuit, you are dead. Your lifespan is about 11 seconds. There's no air. There's no gravity. You're, 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 you simultaneously boil and freeze, there's killer radiation, et cetera. So let's see if we can show you what happens. Can we show you what happens? This is what happens to you in space without a spacesuit. Thank you. 
not good. So you need a spacesuit. Well, let's see. It can design different kinds of spacesuits. The first spacesuit is like a big, you know, robot thing that's stuck in the ground, and you peek out a window. You don't go very far. But if you're Woody Allen, you come up with a better spacesuit. There's Woody Allen's spacesuit right over there. And if the spacesuit is too heavy and too cumbersome, then you've got to hook it up to a rover vehicle like this. Let me see if I can get this to play. I guess it's not showing very well. Uh, that's not showing the screen. But anyway, you get the idea. You're, high, you're tied to an umbilical, and all the life support system is in this rover vehicle to offload all the weight. And there's a considerable amount of mate, weight, roughly 300 plus pounds. So you don't want to walk around with 300 pounds on your back, especially on a place that has gravity, like the moon or Mars. Uh, you can do it in space. Um, what is microgravity, but you have inertia to overcome. So you have to constantly move this 300 pound mass that's uh, on your body. Not good. Well, the second thing you have to know about a spacesuit is you better know where you are and how fast you can walk. And this particular slide shows you why a spacesuit in many ways shapes the entire mission that you go on. Let me give you an example. Spacesuits have two life support systems. One is called a primary. The other is called an emergency. A primary is good for seven and a half to eight hours. The emergency is good for 30 minutes. So if you were designing what we call an exploration envelope, how far would you be allowed to walk from your safe haven to get back and return safely? What would you do? What would you pick as the time that you were allowed to do that? You wouldn't pick eight hours. Because if the primary system failed, you're dead. You would pick 30 minutes, right? So if you pick 30 minutes, now, let's suppose your spacesuit is only good for walking at 6 kilometers an hour. 6 kilometers an hour. Well, you've got to walk 6 kilometers total. That's 3 kilometers out, right? 3 kilometers back. And there you go. The most you can venture out and still have that 30-minute lifeline is 3 kilometers. But let's just suppose. You were smarter than that. You built a better spacesuit than that. Let's suppose that spacesuit can allow you to walk 10 kilometers an hour, right? Well, now you can walk five kilometers out and five kilometers back. It doesn't seem like a lot, but it's every single day. It's every single time you go out. You almost double the amount of space that you can explore. And that's why you're there. It's the only reason somebody has spent billions of dollars to get you to a different planet so that you can explore. So now you see why a spacesuit and the way a spacesuit works is mission critical and very critical in the overall design of how you do these things. Um, next thing you got to know when you do this, I'm learning this stuff really fast because this is month after month. This is uh, 1967. I'm fresh out of Columbia. You know, I was graduated pretty young. And, um, I don't know nothing, so I'm, I'm boning up on this because the target date for Apollo 11 is in 69, July 1969. So you got a lot to learn in a short period of time. Um, don't run out of life support. So if you're going to not run out of life support, you better know how much life support you have left. And the gauges and the way of doing that, of measuring that stuff, is not so easy because you have multiple different kinds of life support. You have oxygen, you have power, you have carbon dioxide removal, you have water that sublimates, cools the whole system. You have all these different kinds of what we call consumables, which are like gas. So that's why it looks so complicated. But the easy way to think about this is to compare a spacesuit to a car. We use the automobile analogy, right? So metabolic rate, how hard you work, that's like horsepower. And consumables, oxygen, water, battery, water, in a spacesuit, they're like gas, right? Your gas mileage depends on the suit design, and it depends how good that suit is. You will get better mileage or worse mileage. And if you put your foot down hard on a gas, on, on, the, on the pedal, your gas mileage goes down. Similarly, if you work harder in a spacesuit just to move it or to do activities, your gas mileage goes down. How much life support you have goes down. It's critical to know this. And so when we do this kind of thing in advance, we do what are called pre-mission predictions. So here's a pre-mission prediction, this red line right there. That red line 
in advance, we, you've probably seen all of these tests that they do on Earth in water tanks, on weight relief systems. All they're really doing is figuring out how hard a person has to work to do a particular task in a particular spacesuit in a particular environment. We want to figure that out in advance. We want to predict it as best we can. And that prediction is a red line. So you see the red line over there, right? Now, if it turns out that you're working harder than that, and that particular red line comes down at, at, right at this point right here. The screen's not picking this up, but that, that line that says consumable depletion line that runs horizontally, it comes down at about 6.6 .6 hours in this particular case. So you know, based on the prediction in advance, that six and a half hours, roughly, that's how much time you've got, right? But what happens if you have to work harder? Well, that's the yellow line. And depending on how much harder you work uh, and the design of the suit, it could come down, in this particular case, at 5.2 hours. Or if you're really good, the terrain isn't too difficult, uh, your suit's a really good design, you're really smart about what you're doing in your experiments, you could be the green line. And the green line can get you almost to nine hours. So all these factors come into play for how long you've got outside uh, before you run out of life support. And you need to know that, obviously. You really need to know that. So um, next thing I learned is, OK, you got the spacesuit. You're doing this work. Being in a spacesuit is like being in a thermos bottle. Because the reason for that is, at least on the moon, this doesn't, uh, th it doesn't apply to Mars. Mars is a different animal. I could give a whole talk on that. But on the moon and in space, if you face the sun, you can expect the front of your suit facing the sun to be 250 degrees above Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit above zero, and your back facing away from the sun will be 250 degrees below zero. You will boil and freeze at the same time. The only way you can counter that is to put yourself inside a thermos bottle. And that's how spacesuits are designed, with multiple layers and insulation to keep you insulated from that. But thermos bottles are heavy, and they're cumbersome. And if you put a heat source in a thermos bottle, it keeps on getting hotter and hotter. So we discovered that during the Gemini project, where several astronauts went outside with spacesuits that were air-cooled, very limited amount of heat rejection in an air-cooled system, and almost expired. And got sweat in their eyes, couldn't see their way back. We knew there was a real problem. It wasn't going to work. And so the solution came from England from John Billingham of the Royal Aircraft Establishment who had similar issues in fighter pilot. And fighter pilots were getting very hot. And he came up with this ingenious device, which I later did my PhD thesis on, called a liquid cooling garment. Now, a liquid cooling garment, uh, it looks like a pair of long johns. You see a couple of them up there. And uh, through, those, through those long johns are tubes that are stitched, almost like a circulatory system. And these tubes, circulate cold water across your body. And you can control the temperature. You can control the temperature. The backpack selects the temperature because the, the life support system is exposed to space and, be, and a process too complicated to even go into here called sublimation. We can actually reduce the water temperature. And we can control our water. It's, and it's almost like being in a shower with your clothes on and not getting wet. And the remarkable thing about liquid cooling garments they dramatically reduce sweat and dehydration. Many people think it's good for you to sweat. Balderdash. Anybody who sits there and tells you it's sweat, get a sweaty workout. Sweat is what your body does when it has no other recourse to get rid of the heat that you are producing. Give it another recourse, it'll stop doing it. The liquid cooling garment was another recourse. It stopped sweat. It stopped dehydration. In the process, it improved endurance and the ability to work hard. It also did something else. It's like a calorimeter. If you put a certain water temperature into the liquid cool garment, and then you measure the temperature coming out, it tells you how much heat you've pumped into that liquid cool garment, which is very strongly related to how hard you are working. So that was an interesting discovery. And as such, it could be used to measure metabolic rate, or human energy output. <clears throat> so uh, something about this really got me turned on. I, probably, I don't know how much time we have here. Probably best to take questions afterwards. 
So uh, that's Buzz Aldrin's liquid cooling garment, which hangs in my bedroom because I did my PhD thesis on it. I put all kinds of badges on it. If NASA knew I had it, they'd come knocking at the door, take me, throw me in jail, and probably take it and send it to a museum. I'm just kidding. But anyway, you get the idea. <clears throat> the whole idea of this was really fascinating. And that's what triggered uh, the first P, because I'm still a kid, basically. Still a key. The first P in that four Ps is passion. Uh, so it triggered that. And, um, What's this all got to do with the moon landing night? Well, here we are. <clears throat> Apollo 11 is only a year and a half away. I still don't know much about spacesuits because I've just touched the surface of how complex they are and all the different systems and how they, how they work together. But I do know this. I'm excited about liquid cooling garments. And I'm also now starting to get excited about temper control, temperature control in the human body. Thermoregulation. I'm starting to get interested in that came here and did my PhD thesis on that. Fortunately, there's some professors here who thought temperature control in the human body was interesting. So that was a, a fortunate spin-off that happened later. Uh, so what I did was uh, my boss said, listen, what I want you to do is try to mathematically model a human inside of a spacesuit." I said, I don't know how to do that. He says, well, I'll tell you how. You're going to build a little mathematical model, and you're going to start out with two, what we call nodes, two little Two little functions of, uh, of the human, are you going to have, you're going to, well, let, he started even more basic than that. This I had heard of. Are you going to use something called the energy equation or the first law of thermodynamics? Heat in minus heat out is equal to heat stored. That's what it is. Heat in produced, heat removed. The difference between those two is heat stored. If you're producing more heat than you're getting rid of, you get hot. If you're getting rid of more heat than you're producing, you're going to get cold. So he said, take the human body and put it into one lump or one node and apply that equation to it. Then put another lump or another node around that and make that the spacesuit. And, that's, and those, that's what I want you to start with. So we did that. It was called the two node man. So I'm, this is pretty interesting. And it's so interesting, in fact, that I start reading up and, uh, on uh, my Fortran. That's what it was at the time and looking at physiology books. And in short order, I was able to take these two nodes, which you see here the way they're, they were modeled with that equation. Probably most of you can't read it. And I increased it to 8, and then to 16, and then to 41 nodes. And the 41 nodes are a head, an arm, a uh, hand, uh, torso, legs, feet. Each one of them have four, four lumps. There's a, so skin, muscle, fat, and core. You add these up, you have an equation for each one, you get 41 nodes, you have another one for the blood flow that's going through this. So I added a thermoregulatory system. I added a, a model of the liquid cooling garment, which I was so excited about. And then, uh, and then the spacesuit. And that's what this was. This was a uh, 41 node man. So, I discovered that if you do this and you put an environment around this mathematical model, any environment could do. You could put this room, uh, you could do under a swimming pool, or you could put it in a space environment. And the space environment could have gravity or no gravity. It could have partial gravity. It could have all these different things. It could have radiation coming at you. And so uh, doing this with this 41-node man, we were able to determine or predict, that's the right word, predict, temperatures of the suit, body temperatures, life support usage, life support remaining, and astronaut thermal comfort by these abstract methods of relating numbers to hypothetical comfort in a, in a person that based on testing that had been done in the literature. So, so you could do that. And, uh, and I'm pretty jazzed about myself that I can do this sitting in a vacuum. So the next thing you have to know, NASA's a big place. UC Berkeley's a big place. There's only one bureaucracy I've ever seen, personal experience, that's bigger than NASA in terms of a bureaucracy, it's right here. This is worse. This is a lot worse, let me tell you. But uh, why do I say that? Well, because, because NASA's broke up into these pieces. It's got multiple centers. Each center is responsible for a different element like propulsion and guidance and electronics and advanced research and, and air, uh, aerodynamics and, and stuff like that. But where I was at the Johnson Space Center, they were responsible pretty much for crew systems and anything to do with human spaceflight. Well, if you have human spaceflight, you have research involved in the build-up to human spaceflight, and then, then you have a, 
ops, what we call operations. So operations is an entirely different section, and that section of operations is where mission control resides. So mission control is a place where people go who control space flights. They do not do research. They control space flights. They come up with their own ways to do this, multiple different ways, because life is critical when they're in control of this. It's all real time, right? While I'm sitting there in my office, which looks like a typical grad student office around here, and I am get this computer model, right, and it's doing these things, it has really no intersection with the reality of real-time spaceflight. It's just a nice research project. Until one day, I realize and I hear, mission control is responsible to ensure astronaut safety and comfort at all times to manage extravehicular activities in real time, to measure and monitor oxygen, EKG, and metabolic rate in real time, and life consumables usage in real time, and they are responsible for providing algorithms that do that. And I saw that word algorithms, and I said, wait a second, 41 node man is an algorithm, isn't it? So I go to my boss, and my boss he says, well, it is an algorithm, you're right, but it's not our responsibility. And I said, but maybe they don't know as much as we do because we've been doing this. And they're not physiologists and they're not thermal guys. And Well, it's worth, a, worth a, a walk over there to see what they say. So we went over there and lo and behold, they agreed to a contest. <laughs> Remarkable, a contest. We are going to take what we've been doing to show this, and what you've come up with, and anybody else who wants to put their hat in the ring, and we're going to have this contest. And the contest is going to be run in a place called CECIL. NASA's great with acronyms, right? CECIL stands for Space Environment Simulation Laboratory, and it is the largest thermal vacuum chamber in the world. How big is it? That's a person right there at the very bottom standing in front of the largest door in the world, closed upon the largest O-ring in the world, <laughs> and inside you see a spacecraft. That's how big CECIL is. So it was ordained that these tests would put an astronaut inside CECIL who would do activities meant to simulate what he would do or she would do on the moon, and we would measure those activities, and we would use your algorithm to predict how much life support they had left, and then when it was all done, they'd come out and we would measure how much life support they actually had left. And whoever comes closest to the real number is the one we're going to select to actually support these missions in real time. Cool. Uh, so, how do you do this? Uh, well, you have this massive test chamber, you have lots of people uh, you know, supporting all the different elements of the test chamber because you've got to suck out all the air. You've got to put liquid nitrogen into the walls to get the temperature down to what it would be in space. You have a xenon lamp simulating the sun up at the roof. Uh, the level of a vacuum in there is 10 to the minus 5th millimeters of mercury, roughly what it is in space. You are doing pretty much everything that the space environment will give you with the exception of gravity. You're in one gravity, so we, we couldn't do that. Uh, this was enough to try to run these tests. When you run these tests, you outfit an astronaut with every manner of uh, sensors that are measuring what's going on. First of all, you don't want any accidents. I should have added the one slide. Uh, I could show you later on if you want where we did have an accident. Uh, one of the test conductors, test subjects that I work with, the, the cord came loose, he lost oxygen, and in about 30 seconds what you see is his feet going up in the air and the, and the uh, uh, airlock opening up, people rushing in to save him. The only instance we've ever had of somebody actually losing complete uh, pressure and being in a vacuum for a sustained period of time. And he did recover because we got in there so quickly and got him out so quickly. But it's dangerous. Uh, here's, here's some more. Whoops. Um, uh, so you get an idea now when you look at this about all the wiring and all the support to get all this information out to make sure there will be no accidents uh, and that you can rush in and that we're measuring every conceivable kind of thing. So they're fully prepped. This is the spacesuit they were going to wear when they went out on the lunar surface. 
And then we start the whole test running. A lot of people involved in it. It's a massive test. They usually run, for, this one ran, I think, for a couple of weeks. And you get all this data back. Metabolic rate, life support usage, all these things like this. I'm not going to dwell. This is, this is one that's pretty critical. This is how the life support usage uh, looks as it tracks down in time uh, towards zero. And you don't want it to get to zero, obviously. And uh, we ran this for two weeks. And shockingly, to me anyway, after all was said and done, this simple equation I had known nothing about less than a year earlier passed the big test and landed me on console with something called the Metabolic Assessment Team at the Mission Control Center. I had to pinch myself, let me tell you. There was a caveat, a big caveat. None of this would matter unless they actually got to the moon and stepped on the surface and the millions of parts involved in all of this would work in such a way to get the data from them and their spacesuits all the way across a quarter million miles to Earth and into the Mission Control Center to a console that I was going to sit at. So the odds of that happening at this particular time were thought to be minuscule. OK, one thing I neglected to tell you about. You also needed to know what the environment was they were stepping into. Why? Because if you're on the lunar surface where the temperatures can get really hot, if you're in a crater, you know, you're down in, in you go into, into a football stadium just across the way, and you always heard the expression, it's 20 degrees hotter on the field than it is outside, you know? It's always hotter. That's because it's shaped like a, a crater. Sun's rays come in, they bounce off, bounce off the walls, bounce off the sides of the crater before they exit, and you get hotter temperatures. Well, it's like that on the moon, only a lot worse. And so there are places you can go where heat from the sun is going to get into that spacesuit, and the spacesuit is not going to know the difference of that heat versus your heat. And you need to know that difference. You need to know if the heat that's being produced and using up life support is coming from you or it's coming from the sun and the moon. So in order to do that, we created these three-dimensional relief maps that you see here, are two of them. And uh, these relief maps, they're about, uh, mm, some of them are about half the size of this, uh, this board over here, about the size of that over there. And uh, on, they're very high resolution, and uh, they're relief maps. And on these, I don't know if you can see it, because you can't see this, you can see actually every step that they were going to take was carefully orchestrated on these maps with little dots. And massive computer programs, much, much bigger than 41 node man, would look at where they were, what the time of day is, what the inclination of the sun is, all these things, and predicting how much heat, radiation, thermal radiation, was coming into the spacesuit at every step. So we could differentiate that from the uh, heat that was being produced by the body. That was the last thing needed to make this work. And so, Make it work so we're all ready to go. So I ask you, I ask you, if you had done this, and here it is, it's like coming up, uh, the predicted landing date was going to be July 20th. Uh, and here it is earlier, like July 10th, 11th, 12th, 1969. And you knew your job wouldn't start until, if, they actually got to the moon and actually landed and actually stopped. So you're twirling your thumbs, right? and taking a deep breath, I hope it works, I hope it works, I hope it works, but you've got time to kill. You've done everything in advance. It's like you've crammed for your finals, right? You've crammed. You know everything there is to know. You don't want, or maybe you're training for a marathon, and you've already peaked. What are you going to do in the three or four days before? Carbon load, right? Carbo loads. That's what you're going to do. So you're ready to go. What would you do? You'd run to the Cape, as fast as your little feet could carry you, because you had a badge that could get you right up front for that massive launch. And you can't see it, but maybe you can see that little green arrow. See that little green arrow here? <laughs> That's me. And I, believe me, I am as close as you can possibly get, three miles away. And you see the liftoff of Apollo 11 there. So that's what I did. Ran back to Houston. And then I said, OK, now it's time to really get serious and count down. And uh, I've written this book. Uh, I've written a few books. You can Google my name and, uh, and Amazon. You'll see a few books. A lot of this is described in this book. This is a later life that I had 
uh, was a space shuttle, but the first couple of chapters are all about this. And uh, so <clears throat> the night is approaching. They're on their way. They're about to land. Uh, they're going to land something like 11 o'clock at night, Houston time. And I figure I'm going to be up all night. If this works, maybe I'll be up all night anyway. Try to get some sleep. Ha, ha, ha. Try to get some sleep the night like something like this is going to happen. So that was uh, not a very good uh, exercise in judgment. I should have just stayed up. I tossed and turned. I went back and forth. I set an alarm. That was ridiculous, too. Finally, I get up, get in my car. And I really didn't do that. I only lived about a mile and a half from the Johnson Space Center. But I got in my car. I drove, went across the uh, gates of security, pulled in, headed towards Mission Control. And as I parked my car in Building 30, the Mission Control building, in the parking lot and got out, started to walk towards the uh, famous double doors entry. And just before I went in those doors, I looked up. And this is what I saw. I saw that, uh, that little red dot right there that you see on the screen. Uh, that is uh, what it looked like the night of uh, July 20th, 1969. We call it a waxing moon that's one quarter full. Uh, tranquility base is right where that red mark is, right at the terminator. So it's just before it's going to get dark because it's, it's uh, low lighting. So it's not going to be too heavy in the way of radiation. And I looked up at that and saw that image, and that was the first time it kind of hit me what was going on. Uh, that's the first time I got goosebumps. And I'll never forget that feeling. The next thing that happened is before I went in the door, I reached in my pocket and I put this on. So this is a badge very few people in the world have. This is a, a badge for Apollo 11. Um, you might see badges like this if you watch some films on Netflix. Some of these film companies have done a very good job reproducing these badges and the other badges. But uh, this is a real badge, and it's in pretty good shape. And I, uh, it's on that spacesuit, along with the other uh, liquid cool garment. So I put that in, and I start to walk through the doors. And then uh, I sit down, and uh, like everybody else at Mission Control, I'm listening and watching. And uh, it didn't take long before it occurred to me and everybody else that there were problems that were happening. This was not going as smooth as uh, planned. And of course, you could hear a pin drop. Now, now I, have to, I have to stop here for a second to tell you, we all have our impression of what it's like to, to, uh, to be in a situation like that. And you think, oh, you're going to land on the moon. It's fantastic. Well, I got, I'm here to tell you that on a mission like this, there are waves of emotion. And it's like serious waves of emotion, one after the other after the other. You think you're past a certain point of worrying about something, and there's another one and another one. It never really stops until they're on the ground. So this was the first one. And so uh, what I'm going to do, hopefully, is play this, and you'll be able to hear it. Uh, and before I do, hopefully, uh, you'll be able to hear it. There's a couple of things I want you to listen for. I want you to listen for the words 1201 alarm, 1202 alarm, pegged on horizontal velocity, and fuel callouts only. Just want you to remember those four things. And after I show this, I'll tell you what they meant, which may be obvious by the time we get through it. <clears throat> Go, same time, we're go. Flight side or right on, real good. 2,000 feet, 2,000 feet, into the ag, 47 degrees. Roger. 47 How's degrees. How's looking, Bob? It looks okay, we're okay. about four and a half. Roger. Eagle looking great, you're go. Eagle looking great, you're go. I think we better be quiet. Roger. We're 400 feet down at nine. Okay, the only call outs from now on will be fuel. Escape forward. 150 feet down at four. Down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. Pretty feet, two and a half down. Great shadow. 
and half a 30. Four forward. Four forward, drift into the right a little. 30. 30 seconds. Down a half. 30 seconds. Forward, just. Good. Okay. Contact right. Okay, engine stop. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So let me, uh, let me elaborate just a little bit. Uh, 12 alarm, 1201 alarm and 1202 alarm are uh, uh, overload, computer overload alarms. That meant the computer was getting more information uh, that it could handle, and it was shutting down some systems. Uh, back in the day, 1969, we're talking about like 36K of memory. Uh, but, but this computer had been brilliantly designed not to fail, not to freeze up, and to prioritize all of its systems. And on top of that, when that came up, nobody in mission control, except one guy by the name of Steve Bales, knew all of this information. Because so the flight, uh, flight director was about to abort. Uh, you have these alarms coming in, that come, it's lit up like a red Christmas, red Christmas tree inside the lunar module. One alarm, then the other alarm, and so the inclination is, oh, it's a, and th then you have to add to the rest of it, pegged on horizontal velocity meant that uh, the lunar module is headed towards a a big boulder field. Uh, the actual place it was supposed to land um, was not the right place because it had these massive boulders and had craters. And uh, Neil Armstrong, who was picked to, to actually be in control for many reasons, too elaborate to get into here, uh, he grabbed control and he started flying horizontally to look for another landing space. So when he says pegged on horizontal velocity, it means he's now leveled off horizontally, stopped the descent, pulled up push the stick forward as fast as it can go horizontally to look for another place to land. So the other thing that's going on is that fuel call outs. So you heard 60 seconds, 30 seconds, when they touched down, actually touched down, there were 15 seconds of fuel left. That's how close it came. Now, that doesn't mean that they were dead because if they abort the bottom the top part of the lunar module would have blasted away from the bottom, and hopefully they could have cleared it and, uh, and made it back home. But nobody ever wanted to do that. That was a very risky maneuver. Nobody wanted to do that. So that's how close it came. So you can imagine when they say we're all turning blue here, everybody knew that. OK, so uh, at this point, they're down on the ground, and I'm now for about the fifth time, having to pinch myself, saying, oh my god, oh my god, right. So now, so here's what, here's what had to happen in order for my little 41 node program to work, along with a lot of other programs that were doing this. The information from their spacesuits, again, I don't have a, I don't have a uh, laser pointer that can show it, but down at the bottom, all that information, which was uh, physiological data, spacesuit data, uh, water temperature data from the liquid cool garment, all these things, oxygen data, had to be sent to the lunar module. That had to be beamed 250,000 miles across the deep space network. It had to be then sent from there to Houston to mission control, where it was put into a whole series of programs that were run by punch cards. <laughs> Think about this. These are mainframes and punch cards. That's what's going on. And my console was just like all the others. Punch cards, controlled, mainframes, IBM 360s and uh, Univac 1108s. So now I'm sitting at a console over here. See, that's me on the far left. And I'm responsible as part of this metabolic assessment team for the operation of the liquid-cooled garment, which I knew was about 80% of all the energy that they were going to produce and therefore very critical in terms of how much life support they had left, and waiting, and waiting, and waiting. 
And uh, we got to have that first step, of course. We got, they've got to be out on the lunar surface, and that's the next wave that happened. tell you about this one. Of course, uh, the manufacturer of the spacesuit, uh, Hamilton Standard, at the time Division of United Technologies, who paired up with International Latex, who basically, before this started, made nothing but Playtex bras, and who won the contract for the spacesuit because they knew about rubber convolutes, and nobody else did. A rubber convolute, imagine you've got to have pressure, you've got to have your spacesuit pressurized, right? That means uh, air pressure is going to compensate because there's no air pressure. So you're in a rubber garment and all these big super high-tech companies like uh, Boeing and Rockwell and all the usual names, Grumman, you know, they're putting in bids on a spacesuit uh, and their spacesuits had rubber uh, pressure bladders. Well, you inflate a rubber pr pressure bladder with a person in it and your hands go like that and your feet go like that and you can't bend anything and they didn't figure that out. The only ones who could figure that out was Playtex Bra. They knew all about rubber convolutes, and they won the contract. And Hamilton Standard, who made the life support system, were so ticked off that they protested. And they were forced to accept Hamil uh, International Latex as their partner to build basically the pressure garment assembly, the entire underpinnings of the spacesuit without the life support system. So that's, how this, that's a whole other story. So now this is all going on, right? other thing is they invested so much time in making this work and they were so scared that somebody's gonna do something to that spacesuit this is the first time let's take it easy don't do anything to put anybody at risk and Buzz Aldrin steps off that ladder and from the minute he steps off that ladder he's doing football plays <laughs> He's doing stops and jumping like a kangaroo. And everybody involved at Hamilton Standard, all of NASA is practically fainting. The guy is out of control. Buzz has always been out of control. Everybody that knows Buzz knows he's out of control, but that's what's an endearing quality of his, but that's what he did. So that's the next step. But you know, now they're, now they're walking around. They're on the surface. And there I am sitting in that corner with my other buddies on console waiting and waiting and waiting. Is anything going to come back after all this? And um, unbelievably, the first thing that comes back is an EKG. So here you see the actual EKG that came back at about a one hour mark into Apollo 11. And you see a buzz, at the t uh, uh, Neil at the top and buzz at the bottom. Neil had a little faster heart rate. They both signed him. They're probably worth a fortune somewhere along the line. I'll probably do something with this. <laughs> and then uh, the EKG came first, and shortly after that, this is what started coming back. Uh, that, the upper left corner is the actual console output, which God knows how I managed to get a picture of 1969. It must have had a Kodak. I'm trying to think of, how did you get a picture of this? Uh, but anyway, I did, and that's all the data. And remember that little line to the right you saw, that red line that I showed you earlier, the red, yellow? And, well, there's the line right there, and there's the output right on top of it. That tells you somebody's working harder than they ought to work, right? That's the kind of thing that was coming back in real time. And so you see that, and when that kind of thing happens, uh, what you've got to do is you've got to warn somebody. And the other thing is, I say warn somebody. If you're sitting in a console on mission control, there is only one person 
who can talk to the astronaut. That's another astronaut called Capcom. Not even the flight director can talk to an astronaut, only the Capcom. So if you want to, if you want to get a message to anybody real time, it has to come from the Capcom, meaning you've got to talk to somebody. Who talks to somebody? Who talks to the Capcom? Which is what we had to do in this particular situation. And you'll see, uh, see what this looks like. So what you heard it what you heard is a chain of command that's going. He's in maximum cooling. You might alert him to change his cooling. It's an inappropriate time because you're using up life support faster than you're supposed to. So that's how this happened in real time. And of course, you're doing this stuff and you're not believing you're a part of it and you're actually having some kind of influence over it. And so that's, that's, you've seen one wave. You've seen a second wave. Now you've seen a third wave. And finally comes fourth out of five waves. The fourth out of five waves is uh, obviously after two hours and 31 minutes and 40 seconds, it's time to get back inside. And hopefully, And that's what they saw. And we didn't see it, but uh, only the onboard camera saw that. So this is another heart-stoppingly tense moment, right? And then uh, once they rendezvoused with uh, Columbia and headed home, came the next moment, which was three days later at Splashtown. And so those chutes had to deploy. It had a land in the right place, and all this stuff happened at uh, July 24th, uh, 4.50 p.m. UTC. I don't know what that is. Houston tell me. I think it's uh, eight hours early or something like that. And the moment that happened, um, I got to be part of the biggest celebration that I've ever seen. People jumping in swimming pools and uh, all kinds of flag-waving cigars and stuff like that. And I've been in a lot of celebrations, but I can assure you nothing came close to this. Um, and then following them being picked up, they had to be quarantined. Is a, there is a, there is a uh, organization called Planetary Protection uh, that basically ensures that we don't bring any detritus and, and bugs and microbes to another planet, especially Mars, which is our next goal and that we don't bring anything back. So in order to do that, you have to be in quarantine. People aboard the Diamond Princess will really relate. <laughs> <clears throat> so they're picked up. They're wearing these big suits, biological isolation garments. They're picked out of the ocean, and they're put into a trailer, an Airstream tra trailer, uh, called the Mobile Quarantine Facility. They are then put into a big C-130, flown to Houston, and put into uh, the uh, Building 37, where I worked for a number of years, where we had uh, the quarantine facility. And here you see all the people that were put in quarantine with them. Uh, that was my roommate at the time. That's Neil and Buzz, and that's John Hirosaki, my roommate at the time. He had the honor of being their chief cook and bottle washer. He had to clean up after them, cook for them, there and, and, until they got back to Houston. And then when they got back to Houston, all these people supported them. And they were in a building where the pressure was kept below the outside pressure. Why below the outside pressure? You want things coming in. You don't want things coming out. Everything they touched was incinerated. Everything that they came in contact with, probably a lot of stuff like this is going on in uh, uh, Diamond Princess and the other cruise ships. Hopefully they've learned from this, because this is what uh, was done. This is what has to be done in the future for any mission that goes to Mars and whenever we have a, a virus of unknown uh, significance like we have now. So when we finished doing all of this on Apollo 11, we did it again on Apollo 12. And again, on Apollo 13, that didn't work out too well, but it did in another way. 14, 15, 16, 17. So if anybody ever asks you, 
hey, it was faked, wasn't it? You say, well, if it was faked, you want to fake it once, you're going to fake it seven times, you're out of your freaking mind? What is what's wrong with you? You're crazy? I could give you a whole, a whole lecture on all the evidence, the hypothetical evidence that people will show you for saying it's fake, that's just all nonsense. But anyway, uh, so with all these missions and all this effort and support, um, little 41 node man and other, other systems that were monitoring this uh, had some pretty close calls. Uh, there, were, there were times where we nearly ran out of life support, in fact. And if you look at it, we had 16 incidents where there was 10% or less life support by the time they got back into the lunar module, 11 less than 8, 3 less than 5, and one incident with 2% remaining. But uh, all of it was handled, and obviously all of it was handled and they were safe. Did that count the emergency? No, no. They didn't, they had the ability to hit the emergency. Thanks, good, good point. So, what did we learn from all of this? And we're going to now march back to the very beginning of this talk. What did we learn? Well, the one thing we learned, first of all, is that the further away you go, you cannot depend on mission control to save the day. If you're in a place like Mars where it can take up to 20 minutes for a signal to reach it, another 20 minutes to come back, you, if you're waiting for an instant answer from home, too late. And that's, by the way, the way that all of the rovers work, the Curiosity rovers and Spirit, now, they all work because the night before they move, a whole team of people are looking from images from orbit, and they're planning a, an excursion, an exploration of very limited duration that they know is safe, because they can see from orbital photos, go this direction, it is safe, and go for this distance. So every night, they're cranking in a distance, sending that information to the, to the rover, and the rover's making the move, and, then, and that's how it goes. It's called prediction correction. That's also, by the way, why they can't come back and look at something that looks really interesting. Because by the time that image comes back and it's decoded, it's already gone on its way. You're not going to hold up exploration because something looks interesting in an image. And believe me, there are a lot of really interesting things on Mars. I could come back and talk about that. Really amazingly interesting things. But knowing all of this, we had to come up with mission control in a box. So if anybody ever goes to Houston and wants to visit the Johnson Space Center, you might go to a place like this where they have uh, um, Space Center Houston and it's been set up like, uh, by Disney. And those are, you, those are you guys up there in a tunnel that's overlooking a test that's going on. So you can actually see this kind of thing. And it won't cost you too much, probably 20 bucks, to go through the whole tour, which is very, really worth doing. And this is what you might see. <coughs> So the, the, the interesting thing about this is these tests are, are, are multi-objective. So in this particular case, this algorithm that we wrote after Apollo 11 that basically replaces mission control, it does all this stuff and it makes these decisions using artificial intelligence, tells them what to do, uh, is only one element of, of a test. You saw a lot of lights blinking. That was uh, motion detection to try to figure out the joint movement of the suit and how efficient it was. There's lots of stuff going on. As you can see, there's quite a few people involved in a test like this. Um, well, my life started to change uh, as it does, and everybody's life changes from events that you participate in. So I've, I've kind of put a little, a little uh, series of uh, um, events that transpired following this. So the first thing was I came to UC Berkeley in the upper left-hand corner and did a PhD thesis on everything that I learned. And following that, I ended up uh, going to work on the space shuttle. And uh, the biggest problem with the space shuttle at the time were tiles, 
see if I can show a little bit of that quickly. Once the problems were discovered, Rockwell had to retest all of the tiles, take off thousands of them that failed, make new ones, reapply them, and test them. All of this was very costly and time-consuming. The tiles became the main cause of launch delay. In an effort to make up for some of the lost time, work went on virtually around the clock. Last July, NASA tile supervisor Larry Kuznets described the overwhelming task before him. Well, basically, we've got a giant jigsaw puzzle. Uh, every piece is different. Every piece has a different history. It's like a giant beehive, and everybody has to know what the other person is doing. The enormity of the problem is obvious. It's kind of like Michelangelo doing the Sistine Chapel while being blind, and uh, only with 1,200 people, and we got to keep them out of each other's way. Who the hell is the engineer on that? For the fragile tiles, there seems to be an infinite variety of potential problems. I, frankly, you know, I never thought uh, anything could upstage my experience on Apollo 11. That did. Because you become part, you become part of it. And uh, very few engineers at NASA ever really touch a spacecraft. Uh, or, or maybe they touch a little bit of it, or maybe they're involved in an algorithm like I was. But to actually see a spacecraft, watch it come together, and people saying, oh, it's not going to work, it's not going to work, there's this problem and that problem. It's almost like you're a football team with a gigantic underdog and uh, you all come together because that's where the buck stopped. And that'll really lift you up. That really becomes part of your, your whole daily life. And of course, speaking of daily life, my boss at the time was overwhelmed with questions about this, and especially from the media. And he said, you've got to do some of this media stuff for me because I can't handle it. And the next thing I know, uh, this is happening. Would you be comfortable uh, leaving, say, next week on this? Uh, be honest now. Now, is it honest? If the doc give me an honest appraisal, would you feel comfortable knowing that these things have had a problem with them, and, and I know they're supposed to be fixed now? But if they come off, if they come off, if even one or two come off, they're not coming off. There's a good big problem, right? <laughs> Did you use Elmer's glue on these? Like, uh, they could. No, I, it's, you, you'd go then. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so you've got some of these uh, applications of the space. Are you involved these times? Would you be... So a lot of these things kind of happened, and a lot of these experiences just, uh, just kind of seemed to fold in. And eventually, it all led back here to UC Berkeley, where I've been teaching classes now for the last few years on how to design a spacesuit for Mars, uh, which is a whole other story. Here's, uh, here's some over at Chabot, where we actually have a conceptual prototype. And let's see if we can get him to play. Oh. It's got to be about two-thirds lighter than anything, uh, anything we've done so far. Massively different in every single way. And uh, again, it's uh, a lot of work and a lot of effort, and it's, uh, it's all very interesting. So uh, where did we start this whole show? We started it with dreams. So what's, what's the take-home lesson? Uh, so mine began with a simple equation. And what's your dream? And we talked about the four Ps, right? So the four Ps, dream high. Passion, priority, persistence, and putting. And uh, most important about all of this is putting yourself out there where the right place meets the right time. And if you do it, it's called good luck. And if you don't, it's called bad luck. And embedded in all that, embedded in all that is the word failure, which most of us shy away from. And we really shouldn't. It's how we learn. Embracing failure is crucial in life. And if we can just change our attitude about failure, uh, things will change. I always give the example about uh, the hunt for Red October and Tom Clancy. Tom Clancy had 158 rejections of the hunt for Red October. Do you have 158 rejections in what you're trying to accomplish? Just, that's what putting yourself out there means. So the plan, which you can't see here, but I'll try to visualize it for you, uh, the 4P plan. It's really simple to do. First thing you do is list your passions. So in the upper left-hand corner, I picked some passions. It, you wanna, if, I, if I go up to this gentleman and say, tell me your passions, don't think about it. Take a piece of paper. Write your passions down. Whatever comes to mind, you can probably think of four, five, six, or seven things you're passionate about, right? And uh, 
So this was, this was the test I gave to these, uh, these ladies that I saw in Colorado. And I said, put your passions down. And so they had passions uh, acting, cats, being a foodie, uh, being a Formula One driver, uh, maybe getting a PhD or an MD, being a billionaire, being a president. So they listed all of these, right? They just put them down randomly. Now next to each one of those, there were three categories of skill level, cost, and time needed. How much skill do you really have to accomplish these? How much time do you really have to accomplish these? How much money do you have to accomplish each of these? Pick a one to five number. And on the, on the one being low and the high being high, more skill is required, more money is required, the higher the number, right? You can put a number associated. It can add all these numbers up, right? So when all these numbers were added up, uh, you, can, you can get a priority order. So you see all the numbers on the right. 11, 9, 9, 13, 14, 10, 15, 13. And once you have those, you reorder it. That's called priority, right? So there's passion. Second one's priority. So what's priority? For this case, it was cats, food, therapist, PhD, acting, president, billionaire, right? So let me show you why I went to these ladies. Because this is what they were doing. Well, you get the picture, right? You get the picture. <laughs> so uh, when all is said and done, all this stuff is, is, uh, is wonderful. But of all the things in, in my experience that I've found the most fulfilling, and I found a lot of things fulfilling, the most important is to be part of a team. And uh, sometimes, sometimes we forget that, how important it is to be part of a team, something bigger than yourself, right? So uh, I'd like to finish this off by uh, Neil Neil's Armstrong's words uh, that he wrote after he got back. And you see the Saturn V on the left, and you see Neil and Buzz and Mike uh, ascending the ladder on the right. And he wrote this, all was ready. Everything had been done. The time had come. As we ascended in the elevator to the top, we knew hundreds of thousands had given their best to give us this chance. Now it was time for us to give our best. So that's a uh, long story short, guys. <laughs> Thank you. I, I know we spent the first uh, 30 minutes today basically herding cats in a cat circus. Um, <laughs> I hope we've embraced and learned from our failure and having backup systems. Hope so. <laughs> Uh, I realize we're a little over time and some of you may have to leave. If you could just kind of quietly slip out, if you could do so, we'll take 10 minutes of questions. Thank you. Yeah, you can stay there. Okay. Uh, yes. Was the overloading of the computer, that happened the first time or was that routinely expected? Did no, it only happened the first time. Uh, other questions? Uh, probably because they are off, off course uh, and he, he pulled it off course. Yes. As we preach that in computer science, the way the program was that all the sensors when they discovered something, there were sensors, how close I'm into the surface, is there a shadow, is there dust coming up, what's the heat or something? They would send a message to the main processor that I see dust coming up, I see light, I see this and that. And there were so many messages coming in that the CPU could no longer function. And then from that they learned, it says next time, that's not how it works. You let the CPU ask, says, does anybody see dust coming up? Does anybody see light coming up? And only ask those questions that are immediately relevant for that moment to do something. And then the problem was going away. Oh. Thank you for that. Yes. I see you again. 
I was in your class in 86 for physiology where you built the oh. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What happened to it? I know it was up in Lawrence Hall. Oh, yes. You're asking me what happened to it? Yeah. Unfortunately, that's one of the things about uh, UC Berkeley's bureaucracy. Uh, <laughs> I could, show you, I, could, I could show you the video of that. It was a pretty remarkable project. In fact, maybe it's worth showing because it's another example of what happens uh, when you really have people who are passionate. Let me see if I can find it because it uh, really is worth looking at. Um, well, maybe. Wow. You want to give me a hand with this again? <laughs> it's too tiny for me to read. Or whatever reason. Uh, open it up again. I think it may be in this one towards the end. Just open it again. Oh, close it? No, open it. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, just go to uh, current slide. Let me see if it may be at the very end. Let's see. You're at slide 92. Okay, I want to go and show. Oops, I meant to go all the way here to the end. Oh. That's the That's last, last one. The last okay, slide. we're going to have to get another one. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you what to do. Um, stop this and go to. Is that it's called so desktop? Crazy. Um, that is called desktop, yeah. Okay, go to public lectures. Is this one? This one right here, yep. And then go to slide one. It's the first one. Uh, suits? Yeah, suits well, lecture. Sweet lecture PowerPoint. Yeah. Um, Professor Carlos Sakan okay, here. Uh, uh, to it's going to be talking about some of the sculptures. Uh, so a uh, mathematician and also uh, an incredible sculptor. We're going to be back down in genetics and plant biology. Hopefully the technical gremlins will be uh, a little less problematic down there. Um, make sure to find out the date. It is the third Saturday of next month, uh, which is the 21st of March. And then uh, Cal Day is the following month, so the big campus open house, where we might have a lecture specifically with uh, a lot of activities going on for us. <coughs> We'll have it in a moment. Oh, there. Go back. Go back. Go back to her. Uh, let's see. It seems real down to the last switch. And the former astronaut, Warren Acton, who took his first tour of the model tonight. Unbelievable. And think that it was done for practically nothing. You know, these things usually cost millions of dollars. It's truly impressive. Sitting high atop the Berkeley Hills behind the Hall of Science, it's a memorial to the seven Challenger astronauts. This is a fantastic way to fulfill the mission of that flight, which was teaching children about the wonders of science, and that's what we want, and that's what we think it can do. A quiet ceremony today featured one of Christy McCall's best friends from high school. I mourn the loss of my friend. It still hurts, but your work has made it easier and has given me a place to work through so much of it. Student volunteers did most of the work using original blueprints. There's a typical space meal, even an authentic space. I have to see that it's a, it makes me want to go up. I wonder what it would be like to really go up. The science hall is studying the memorial's potential as a teaching tool, but there's no doubt about the feeling. This is what it must be like to fly into space. In Berkeley, Kim Peterson, the New Center for. So, I mean, we had about, uh, gosh, about 100 companies in Berkeley donating. Uh, we had 10,000 man hours. We had people volunteering, all kinds of things that made that happen. It took about three years to do it. And then it uh, was up to the Lawrence Hall of Science to manage it. And because it wasn't built by them and they didn't have a budget for it, it did last 10 years and they hauled it away. But that's bureaucracies for you. So yes, that's what became of it, just so you know. Uh, other questions? Sorry about the digression. Yes? Um, so so going from uh, test conditions at uh, in a giant uh, chamber. chamber to the moon, what were the biggest uncertainties in your algorithm? And how certain were you it was going to work, and how well did it work? Uh, the <laughs> algorithm worked very well. Uh, most everything worked pretty well. Uh, as far as uncertainty, there was a lot of uncertainty. And in, in so many different venues. I mean, up until, I guess by Apollo 11, we already knew that the 
the surface was hard and we weren't going to sink in six feet of dust because people were predicting that before we landed uh, Ranger or one of the early things. And there was just a lot of uncertainty that all the predictions, anytime you make predictions, you know, GIGO, you know what GIGO means? Garbage in, garbage out, got computers, that's what you got. So you, you're crossing your fingers. But you have to have, you have to be willing to take a chance. And back in those days, NASA really, uh, and to some degree uh, today, is willing to take a, a chance. Um, but because it's so, such a public venue, um, it's gotten more and more shy of it. Now, SpaceX and Elon Musk have taken up the challenge of, uh, of risk. It's all risk reward, and, you, and somebody at, at some point has to make that. Speaking of reward, I mean, you know, many of you probably know, but the space program uh, is not expensive. It's about a half a penny on your tax dollar. So you want to compare that to military budget, the 40 cents on your tax dollar or, or health care. Uh, it's not a place you go looking to cut because the benefits are so great. So anyway, just my little two cents in there. Uh, back in the back there. Do you have any favorite movie spaces? <laughs> favorite movies? Yeah. I would see, I mean, you've all seen the big headliners like uh, First Man <clears throat> and um, stuff like that. My favorite is actually on Netflix, and it's called Last Man on the Moon. <clears throat> and it's a, it's a story of um, Gene Cernan who was the last astronaut on the moon, and it's a documentary, and he's, unlike Neil, uh, Neil was very, very pensive, very thoughtful about what he did and said. Uh, Gene is very emotional and lets his feelings be known immediately, and um, you, you get the sense of uh, immediate, uh, immediacy with him that some people are gonna die doing this, and that he's gonna be away from his family, and then you hear his wife, Barbara Cernan, come on quite a few times and saying this is how difficult it is. He makes one great line. You think going to the moon is tough? Try staying home. <laughs> <clears throat> and I've gotten to know her. Her and uh, Sue Bean, uh, the wife of Alan Bean on Apollo 12, three of us give talks on cruise ships together. So I've gotten to know them pretty well. And uh, that side of the story, uh, the emotional side of the story is, uh, I mean, I've heard a little technical stuff through here already, but the emotional side of the story is really powerful. So I would, I would pick that one. Another one that just came out on um, Prime is Armstrong. It's just the name of it is Armstrong. And it tells, it looks into Neil Armstrong's personality and also his wife, Jan. And she unloads too. The both of them really unload in a way that makes this, you know, a whole different look at, at what it's like to be doing this kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Could you explain about with Mars in the future if you were... The consultant are still working with NASA designing the spacesuit, how would be different? And if you were on it for a long period of time, would you oh, need cool. different uh, conditions for a spaceship? Yeah. Well, I could give a lecture on why we shouldn't be going to the moon at all, and why we should be going to directly to Mars. I mean, it's very powerful reasons. The reason that people are talking about the moon is strictly political. Uh, and I'd love to give you that talk. I think it's a pretty powerful uh, measure of why the human race ought to be doing this, but that's not the question you asked. So the question you asked is why is it so different? <clears throat> well, the moon has one-sixth gravity. Mars has 38%, nearly 40%. What that means is if you take a 400-pound spacesuit and you multiply it by 40%, it's 160 pounds. It has been shown repeatedly that if you want to do work as a blue-collar worker, a geologist, an explorer, uh, or somebody in the military on, on missions, you should have no more than the equivalent of 50 pounds on your back. 50 pounds on your back on Mars is a 135 pound spacesuit. So right up front, you've got to get from almost 400 pounds to 135 pounds. That's uh, a challenging task. Uh, on the other side of the coin, Mars is a planet. It's not the moon, it has an atmosphere. <clears throat> it has much more reasonable temperatures. Uh, it has resources that you can use inside the spacesuit, and if you're clever about how to use them, you can accomplish all that. So the most radical uh, element of the suit that we've designed is it's two suits in one. There's a helmet and there's a torso. So the helmet uses oxygen, and it has little tanks that supply the oxygen much as the, it does in a fireman outfit, fireman rebreather outfit. 
but the torso doesn't use the oxygen. The torso actually uses the atmosphere of Mars to pressurize it. So you have a little uh, compressor, mini compressor, and it's compressing uh, the outside atmosphere of carbon dioxide. It's pressurizing the torso. It's coming in and it's blowing all the waste out of a relief valve. So it basically is an in-out flow-through system. So if, because you have an in-out flow-through system, you don't need tanks, pumps, heat exchangers, fans, all the stuff that makes up the mass that you're talking about in current spacesuits. And you can get the mass down to about 135 pounds. Of course, you can't let any of that gas from the outside come up to the helmet. And that's part of the devil of the details. How do you separate the helmet completely from the torso? And there are ways to do it. That's part of the challenge. You have to make sure, just like in the quarantine situation, that the pressure in the helmet is slightly higher than the pressure in the torso. Because if any gas is going anywhere, its oxygen is going down. It's not CO2 or planetary atmosphere coming up, because you don't know what's in that atmosphere. That could kill you, for all we know. So that's, those are just some of the elements that uh, are necessary in that design. Yeah? I was interested in the communication system on Apollo 11. You mentioned punch cards, and you've got sensors on the surface. You've got your 360s and 1108s, and then you've got a display system. Was there a punch card step in the middle of that? Or was uh, that no, I don't think so. <coughs> no, that was, that was live data. There's live data and there's processed algorithm data, so that's what that was for. Yeah? Yeah. Um, from the suits then to the suits now, how much more operational time do they have? Um, no more difference. The, the, basically, the suits they're using today, they're virtually identical to those suits. They look a little different. Uh, in fact, they've lost some, uh, some ability. They can't use the lower torso. They can't walk. Current spacesuits are designed for, for ISS and for, for, for shuttle or anything else in space. Uh, they're not designed to lose, use your lower body, which is often brought up the question of why not send uh, quadriplegics up? <laughs> because you don't need to use your lower body. You don't. In fact, if you don't do an awful lot of exercise two and a half hours a day, you're going to lose muscle mass and uh, all kinds of other things are going to happen. So uh, you need to have a pretty good rigorous exercise tailor-made for you to keep that from happening, especially osteoporosis, uh, among other things. Sorry to cut off the questions. Um, <laughs> our video folks need to go. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you.